I'm ready. Are we ready? I'm ready when you are. Okay. I know most everyone here except for the two of you. I'm Travis. Um, I'm the nutrition coach here at Thrive, and you guys I'm are? I, I'm Janice Miller. I'm Boyce's mom. Oh, okay. I'm Boyd Miller. I'm oh, nice to meet you. Boyd's father. <laughs> nice to meet you. I couldn't catch that one. <laughs> I'm Travis Jansen. <laughs> like, yeah. Anyway, so um, I wanted to um, talk about food because that's what I do. And um, thank you all for coming and listening if you're listening to me. Hopefully, I'm probably not going to go an hour because um, Sharon covered some of the stuff I was going to talk about. So um, there will be a surprise at the end. I always bring food with me, so um, you'll get a little treat. So I just wanted to give you some statistics because um, a lot of two things that one of the two things that come out of stress is anxiety and depression and that is something that is rampant in our country today these are some statistics the New York Times says that more than 30 million Americans are currently taking an antidepressant one in four women in their 40s to 50s take an antidepressant plus anxiety disorders are the most common ailment affecting more than 40 million Americans 18 years of age and over so I think we're making the pharmaceutical companies really rich. I'm not going to say that antidepressants and anxiety meds are not necessary sometimes, but I think that trying a more natural approach through nutrition, exercise, meditation, stress reducing things can maybe um, take down some of these numbers. So um, that's what I'm going to talk about is how you can help yourself through your nutrition, if you are somebody who has a very stressful life, um, you know, or job or whatever. So, um, Sharon covered the stress response. I just want to kind of talk about the two most common hormones that um, are released during a stressful event. Um, everybody reacts differently um, to stress. Some people are really very good about handling stress. They've become resilient over time. They've learned how to deal with it. And then some people just don't do very well with it. So um, there's a center in our brain called the hypothalamus, which is like control central for all the hormones that we need in our body to do some of our bodily functions every day. It's um, what releases inside of the hypothalamus is your pituitary gland, and that's where um, that's kind of like the general who, once you experience stress, who throws out the call and said, you know, fight or flight, sends the signal down to your adrenal glands, which releases the hormones that are involved in the fight or flight response. The first one is adrenaline. That's what turns on your sympathetic nervous system. That's what starts the elevation of your heart rate, your respiratory rate, your blood pressure. It kind of gets you ready to do what you need to do. And then the second one is cortisol. Cortisol is a very necessary hormone. It's life-sustaining. Um, it what helps us seek or helps us to come back into homeostasis. The downside to cortisol is whenever it is elevated and circulating throughout your body all day long from a stressful situation or from not dealing with stress in a healthful way. So that's the, that's the hormone that helps us, but also hurts us over time. So um, there's two types of stresses. There's acute stress, which is the stress that we're aware of. You know, if you fall down and break a leg, that's a stressful event. It's acute, but it's going to be over. You're going to, you know, have surgery or get your leg set, and it's going to be over and done. Chronic stress is the type of stress that just grinds on you day in and day out. You never see an end. It could be that you're trapped in a terrible job that you can't stand, in an unhappy marriage. Um, you know, you've just been given a life-threatening illness diagnosis and you don't have the resources to deal with that. You don't know even how to get over it or come out of it or see an end to it. That's the type of stress that is unhealthy. That's the type of stress that keeps your cortisol elevated all day long and circulating throughout your body. Your cortisol should be rhythmic. It should go along with your circadian rhythm. It's the hormone that wakes us up in the morning. 
and it's also should drop off throughout the day to be its lowest at night so that we can go to bed and go to sleep. But if you are constantly having that cortisol carry through your body, you're creating, your body's creating this environment where you're going to not lose weight like you want to, you're going to have high blood pressure, you're going to have blood sugar problems because cortisol impacts your blood sugar. Um, you know, you're going to carry around belly fat. That's one of the number one things. People always say to me, I can't lose my belly fat. Well, the first thing I say to them is, are you under a lot of stress? Do you know stress reduction techniques? You know, if you got your diet on point and you can't get rid of that belly fat, that's the next thing that I would look at is, are you carrying around a lot of cortisol? So, um, I'm not going to write a bunch of words up here, but um, there's no lasting ill effects to acute stress like there is to chronic stress. So when you look at what chronic stress does to you, how you can look at the, the foods, as I was doing this, I was like, oh wow, I can see where the nutrition would play into um, the stress response. So cortisol decreases your cognitive performance, which is your ability to think and you ever had like a foggy feeling in your head where you just can't think things through? Um, that decreases your, oh I wrote the wrong word, <laughs> I'm thinking impairment, it's performance. Um, it also decreases thyroid function. Your thyroid is very important for maintaining weight, to help you lose weight, to help you maintain weight. It causes blood sugar imbalance. It does this because it causes your liver to release, it goes to your liver and it tells it to release glucose for the energy you're going to need to fight or flight. Um, it disrupts your sleep because if it's elevated, you're not going to be able to sleep. It's going to keep you waking up over and over again through the night. Elevates blood pressure, decreases your immune system because your body doesn't want your immune system turned on to fight back against what it's trying to do to help you to survive. And then, like I said, increases belly fat which leads to cardiovascular disease, diabetes, stroke, all that. Everybody's heard that. So when you're looking at food, I'm sure you can think, um, at least I could, of the things that I would need to do to combat this. So um, what stress does in your body is it increases every metabolic process in your body. So by doing that, it depletes vitamins and minerals that you need. And that's where your focus needs to be when it comes to food. What's the first thing, when you're under stress, what kind of food do you want to eat? You've had a really, oh, junk food. junk food, right. You want to eat pizza, you want to eat chips. Um, sometimes it's not food, you want to drink alcohol. You come home from a a long day at work and you're like, I need a beer. I need a couple of beers. So, or, 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 you know, you need to smoke a cigarette. A lot of people smoke out of anxiety and stress. So that is your body reacting to the stress because what it's searching for is serotonin, which is a hormone that helps you to feel good and calm down. And um, that's what comfort foods do. Now, we can't, you don't get serotonin from food, but you get serotonin from something that's in food. So, um, your this sets your body up to wanting bad things, because if that's what you're going to do, if you're going to eat a lot of potato chips and smoke, drink alcohol, and eat all that junk food, what's going to happen to your body? What's the first thing you're going to, what's going to happen if you eat like that? You're going to gain weight. Right. You gain weight, you set yourself up for all those chronic diseases we talked about. 
What your body really needs, though, when it's under stress, is nutrient-dense food. That's what it really needs. It's not the serotonin that you're going to get out of those kind of foods are going to be short-lived. It's going to be, you know, you're going to feel good for a little bit, and then you're going to crash. And then you're going to want more, and you're going to feel good for a little bit, and you're going to crash. So what? what you should do is eat more nutrient dense food because it's going to carry your energy longer you're not going to have that blood sugar crashing up and down and you're going to have improved overall health so, I have a so how does your brain know how to get caught up on nutrient dense food when it's used to the good stuff that gives you the good rest well we'll get there okay. we'll get there okay um, so there's the three most important things that you need to focus on in your diet when you're under stress is antioxidants, the B vitamins, and omega-3 fats. Okay. So the reason you want antioxidants is because it was really kind of cool researching this to see. So vitamin C is an antioxidant. It supports your immune system. Vitamin E is another antioxidant. When your vitamin C, all these, all because of the increased metabolic signaling and, and functions that your cells are going through when you're under stress, these get rapidly depleted out of your body. And some of them are acutely sensitive to stress. So stress really throws them out of your system. And vitamin C is one of those. And if your vitamin C flows out, it pulls the vitamin E right along with it because vitamin E relies on vitamin C to keep it inside of your body. Some of the other ones is calcium and magnesium. Those were two minerals that I never really gave much thought to and um, when I did this research I thought of it, it's calcium lives outside the cells, magnesium is inside the cells. Magnesium is extremely sensitive to stress. They work as a team but they are opposite of each other. So calcium causes your muscles to contract, magnesium causes them to relax. You know, cal calcium causes your blood to clot, magnesium causes it to flow freely. So if, uh, and in a stress response, the calcium just sh shuttles into the cell and squashes down the magnesium. And the magnesium is already sensitive. So it gets it all out of balance and it doesn't return to balance until the magnesium can build back up and shove that calcium back out the door. I think of it like you're in your house and your family's all having a nice dinner and you're invaded by a whole bunch of obnoxious people, <laughs> you know, and they're taking over and you know some people are going to run out the back door but somebody's going to have to stand there and hold their ground and, and shove those obnoxious people back out. So that's the kind of stuff that you need from your food and you need to eat the right foods to help with that. So uh, B vitamins are necessary because they are really important in the metabolic processes that your cells are undergoing when you're under stress. So you don't want to you know, lose your B vitamins because then your cells aren't going to be able to metabolically turn over and do all the things that they need to do. Um, Omega-3 fats are extremely important for a variety of things. They help with the inflammation that happens in your brain from stress. They help to decrease that. Your, your, um, they're really important. They increase the functionality of the serotonin. So if you don't have omega-3 fats in your diet, it doesn't matter that you're eating all these foods with you know, serotonin, serotonin in them because it's not going to work optimally. Um, and it's essential for optimal functioning in your brain uh, for motivation and emotional balance. So they actually have done studies um, giving schizophrenics uh, omega-3 fats, just supplementing them with that, and they've actually gotten uh, they, there's less fighting amongst them in, when, you know, in the institutions and um, they get along better and um, they, it's really key for that. So, the other thing is zinc. Zinc is also something I never really thought much about. But zinc, they say, is in every tissue of your body and it's crucial for cell division. Our cells are dividing every day. That's how we repair and, and recover and you know, cells die off and they get replaced. So if your zinc 
is gone and depleted, your cells aren't going to turn over, they're not going to divide as well, they're not going to communicate, and then um, stress exacerbates low levels of zinc in our system. So we can't really store zinc, we have to take zinc in every day in our food. So if you're not doing that on a regular basis and then you get stressed out, well guess what? Your zinc's going to be completely gone. So um, now we can get to foods. So let's go back because I can't remember all this. <laughs> antioxidants. Where do you, Sharon, you know, where do you find antioxidants in your diet? Fruits and vegetables. Fruits and vegetables. So I cannot speak highly enough about, I don't think people eat enough vegetables. I think you have to be careful with fruit. Fruit's necessary, but fruit can put weight on you. Um, so you need to eat five to ten servings of fruits or vegetables. And many people don't think about eating vegetables with their breakfast because I think people have mindsets of what foods need to be certain times of the day. There's nothing to say that you can't eat vegetables with your breakfast, you know, and get them in, get them in every time that you eat and, that, and um, fix them in different ways. People, I think uh, our parents kind of ruined us when it comes to vegetables. You can remember Brussels sprouts being those mushy, oh, awful tasting things that your mom would turn on the table. So <laughs> try, you know, try eating local vegetables. They're going to be more rich in, in the antioxidants and the nutrients. Um, fix them different ways. You don't overcook them to death. Um, fix them, you know, roast them in the oven. Try some different recipes when it comes to vegetables because really vegetables are really good. I mean, they, there's so many of them out there. So broaden your get out of that box in your head and, and think about eating more of those. That's where you're going to get all those antioxidants, a lot of those minerals and vitamins that you need. B vitamins come from beef, animal protein. There's some B vitamins in dairy. Um, what I have to say about animal protein is try to eat grass fed. Try to look for pastured raised. I know it costs a little bit more just start someplace. If you can only afford grass-fed beef, then eat grass-fed beef. You're going to get more vitamins, more healthy fats out of something like that rather than grain-fed. Wild-caught seafood is another uh, source of B vitamins. Um, green leafy vegetables, once again, they're back in um, those um, are really important. Pastured eggs are really good sources of B vitamins. Omega-3 fats come from wild-caught salmon, fattier fish. Um, they're in a lot of nuts, like walnuts are high in omega-3s. Um, Grass-fed dairy um, has some omega-3s in it. Um, trying to look here and see. Um, anyway, so Green leafy vegetables, dark leafy greens, and asparagus are really good sources of um, a lot of vitamins and minerals. Tryptophan, has everybody heard of that? That's in Turkey. So think of Thanksgiving Day. If there's anything like my grandmother's house on Thanksgiving, everybody, you know, you have mashed potatoes, sweet potatoes, all those uh, pies, you have turkey, you eat all of that, you're getting a lot of tryptophan out of, out of that type of food. And tryptophan is converted to serotonin in our bodies. That's where you get your serotonin from. So you want to eat organic turkey. You want to eat um, pumpkin seeds. A lot of nuts have serotonin. Serotonin in a free-range eggs are another example. Shrimp has serotonin, I mean, uh, tryptophan in it. Try to put those foods into your diet. For a minute, foods, I want to talk a little bit about your gut and the stress response. So Sharon covered about how stress decreases your digestion. The other thing that happens in your gut is your gut lies right next to your immune system in your body. They communicate very closely. So sometimes if your gut 
bacteria is not optimal for digest for digesting, you're not going to absorb those nutrients. I don't care how much good food you're eating, you're not going to get everything out of that that you need to get. So because of the world we live in where we've been treated with antibiotics, everything's antibacterial, all these hand sanitizers, household cleaners, you know, we're kind of doing a disservice to our gut by never ex exposing it to, to the bacteria that it needs to digest our food and to be healthy. So that's why it's important to add in some fermented food into your diet, which is sauerkraut. Um, kombucha is something you can buy out in the store, which is a fermented tea. You can use a probiotic. Um, I would recommend anyone, you know, everyone should probably take a probiotic because if your gut's not right, everything else isn't going to be right. You're not going to lose weight. You're not going to digest your food right. You're going to have stomach ailments. So take care of your gut and eat some fermented food or supplement with a probiotic. Um, You can make your own. It is not, it's not hard to make. No, it's not. You have to, there is a variety, um, and it's like, it comes in a can, and I will do that, and it's just sauerkraut. It's not got any kind of, it's, I think, Snowflake is the brand name. Right, so, but you can make your own at home. It's super simple. You, you know, I don't know the recipe off the top of my head, but you just shred up cabbage, and you put it down in a mason jar with salt, I don't know if it's just water or if it's got something else in it. You put a lid on it and you let it sit for so many days. You have to loosen the lid in periodically and you just let it sit on your countertop. I don't know how long it is, but you can make, plenty of people make their own sauerkraut at home. Yeah, so um, nuts are a good source of a lot of magnesium and zinc and omega-3s, dark chocolate. I love dark chocolate. That's another good thing to have in your diet. It um, contains a chemical that temporary, temporarily blocks our feelings of pain and depression. So, um, you know, you can't eat dark chocolate all day long, but you can certainly have, you know, a, a piece or two in a day. Avocados are another great source of um, vitamin E and B vitamins, and they're very good um, healthy fats to have in your diet. Um, yeah. Dark chocolate. I always hear this. It has to be so much percent. What's, what's I, the I shoot for over 80%. You want it just as dark as it can be. And I want, you, what you need to look for when you're looking at dark chocolate is a lot of that has soy in it. And you want to avoid soy as much as you can. It disrupts your thyroid and does a whole bunch of other stuff. So you want to, there's, I know that it's out there, so just check the label. I, off the top of my head, I know Kroger sells um, one, and I can see it, and I buy it for myself, and it's soy-free and doesn't have um, any other bad things in it. So more than 80%. More than 80%. You want it as dark as it can possibly be. And I think 85 might be the limit on that. Okay? So, you got any other questions? So you want to avoid sugar when you're under stress. You want to avoid sugar, in my eyes, all the time. Um, but you really want to stick away, stay away from it when you're under stress. It's inflammatory. You're already getting inflamed from the, the stress you're under. Stay away from that. Eat whole, real food. That's where you're going to get all the nourishment and the nutrition that you need to combat the stress that you're under to replace what you're losing, what your body is just losing from that stress response. Okay? So I have a tendency at night when I'm tired, it's the end of the day, it's right before I'm going to go to bed. I have a tendency to eat a whole bunch of sugar. Mm -hmm. Is that something that you have a piece of dark chocolate? Is that enough? <laughs> is there something else I should do? Any, I mean, should I meditate? Well, yeah, why don't you have a piece of dark chocolate and meditate? No, that's a sugar in it. No, dark chocolate. If you've got to have something sweet before you go to bed at night, I would just eat a piece of dark chocolate. That 80%? That is not sweet to me. That is just bitter. It tastes bitter. You got choices to make, Elaine. <laughs> I, you know what I do? I'll be honest with you. What I do, and it's it's, is I make protein pudding. If I gotta have something sweet, oh no, that would work. Yeah, I just that have, 
Yeah, I just have some protein pudding. I put a nut butter, a good nut butter in there. You're getting some of uh, you know, the good benefits out of the nuts, the magnesium, the zinc, the, all of that that you need. And just eat that before you go to bed then. Okay? I'm not, I, I, can't, <laughs> I can't stand here and say you can eat chocolate chip cookies. <laughs> right. I know. <laughs> I, I was looking for options. So, <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Any other questions? You going to go home and eat your vegetables and your fruit? <laughs> I look. <laughs> I don't like fruit, but I like vegetables. You I do like, like some fruit. You do? Yeah. Well, that's, well, fruit's good, so. Yes, love it. Yeah, um, you know, you get, pineapple has tryptophan in it. I didn't realize that. So, um, if you really, if you want to know, oh, so I wrote this all down because I can't remember all this. So foods that are high in tryptophan are eggs, cheese, pineapples, salmon, nuts, seeds, turkey, and steel-cut oats. I thought that was interesting. What's that? Is that a good thing or a tryptophan is a good thing. You need tryptophan because that converts to serotonin in your oh, body. Okay. Okay. So if you're stressed out, yeah, eat more turkey. Okay. Or I was just gonna say, just I, was always, I always relate tryptophan with just falling asleep. So. Yeah, well that's why okay. you fall. That's why because it converts to serotonin, which calms you and makes you sleepy. Okay. No, tryptophan's a good thing. All you ladies, it's not the football game after we eat that puts us to sleep. So omega-3s are in walnuts, flax seeds, chia seeds, wild-caught salmon, tuna, grass-fed meat, and egg yolks. Don't throw away your egg yolks. Don't be fooled by what you've been led to believe about eggs and egg yolks. So tryptophan, I went over that, free-range eggs, shrimp, you can eat dairy and legumes. I want to say if you tolerate it. Not everybody tolerates dairy or beans. So you have to know that about yourself. Um, turkey, pumpkin seeds, nuts, eggs. Magnesium is, a, is one that uh, I personally supplement magnesium, but you can get it from green leafy vegetables, spinach, and Swiss chard. Swiss chard is delicious. If you've not had Swiss chard, you should try it. Try it with your eggs for breakfast. You won't be sorry. I think it's really good. Almonds, dark chocolate, yogurt. <clears throat> Kefir is a fermented type of food. Bananas, avocados, cashews. Foods rich in zinc are, oh, oysters are the number one. If you can stomach to eat an oyster. <laughs> I know, it's like, <laughs> Beef, crab, uh, chickpeas, so hummus um, is rich in zinc. Uh, the dark meat of a chicken has a lot of zinc in it. Swiss cheese, foods rich in calcium. Everybody thinks you have to get calcium from dairy. You can get calcium from your dark leafy green vegetables as well. I Kale. You talked about yogurt. Uh huh. Yogurt's very confusing because I used to eat a lot of Greek yogurt and found out stuff about sugar. Mm -hmm. So how do you figure out what is the right yogurt? Because they all say it's Greek, it's healthy, but they're all like loaded with sugar. Right. All of them are. I'm not going to say they're not. When it comes to yogurt, I don't personally promote yogurt because of the sugar content, but I have several clients who just love to eat yogurt. So if you want to eat yogurt, eat grass-fed yogurt. You can find it down at Fresh Time. You're going to get the benefits of the grass-fed dairy uh, and look for one that is absolutely as low in sugar as you can find but make sure that it's got protein in it. At least get some of that benefit. Have you ever, have you ever looked at this Kroger Carb Master yogurt? Like, does it have a whole lot of sugar? Um, I've, I've seen that, but there's one better, and it's called Zero Ocus. What's that? O I? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Oikos. Yes. Oikos. Yeah, and it's got a black label on it. That's like one of the better ones. Yeah, and then don't, you know, if you're going to eat yogurt, don't pile a bunch of fruit and granola in it. You're just adding to that sugar content, okay? Um, kale is a really good dark, dark leaf, leafy green vegetable rich in calcium. And then foods rich in vitamin E are raw seeds, avocado, broccoli, olives are rich in vitamin E. I love olives. Coconut oil and olive oil are good sources of vitamin E. Okay, this is a salad <coughs> made from spinach with fruit, just a little bit of feta cheese, 
It called for pistachios, but my God, are they expensive. <laughs> They're like $13 for a little container. So I just threw walnuts in. They're rich in omega-3s. This would be a good um, salad to have. You could have like a slice of turkey, roast some turkey or wild-caught salmon, and that would be a really good meal to have on a very stressful day, you're going to be replenishing some of the things that you have lost. What's the, dressing? the dressing is homemade dressing. It has um, fruit, a little bit of honey, olive oil, some apple cider vinegar, Italian seasoning, salt, and pepper. Yeah, it's really super. I mean, I made it this morning in a matter of you know five minutes in my NutriBullet. Super simple. Okay. Any other questions? For um, your brain, though, Phil, you need omega threes. You need it. You need to have a lot of omega threes in your diet. It helps with the signaling. Your cells, when they get under stress, can't signal properly to each other because of of the depletion of the you know micronutrients. So. So what if we can't afford the good fish because all the fish at the store is full of chemicals? Right. So. Do you recommend? I would supplement with a good fish oil. Okay. Yeah. A good fish oil daily. I, I, I. That's what I tell my, I tell our clients is that you know, fish oil is extremely. You know, you got to pick out a good brand. You got it's got to come from small fish. You can't, you know, get the two for one deal. Um, you want it to be in a dark bottle. Don't buy fish oil ever that's in a light colored bottle, because light oxidizes oils and it's gonna make it go rancid. It could. It's probably rancid by the time you buy it if you're buying one like that. Um, which it's, it's not good. It's already oxidized and you're just adding inflammation to your body. So get a good fish oil and take it every day. It'll help your joints. It helps decrease the inflammation in your body. Helps your brain signaling. Is there a uh, number of times to eat fish? To eat fish? Well, you have to worry, you know, people worry about eating fish with the mercury, you know, the bigger fish it is, the more mercury it's going to have. But I have read that if you eat fish that's also high in selenium, that the selenium, the mercury binds to the selenium, so therefore it doesn't bind to you. So if tuna, um, salmon, I would say, you know, eat fish two to three times a week if you can. Some people just don't like it. But, um, you know, I used to eat tuna every day for lunch. I never had any mercury problems that I was aware of. But I would say, you know, most of us, if everybody likes fish, I would try to eat fish at least once a week. Yeah. Because it's always better to get it from whole food rather than a supplement. Yeah, that's where 90% of it comes or something like Well, what I read was that the, the fish, I, what do they call them, hatcheries or whatever over here, they catch the fish... Right, right, right. And they, they're sending our fish to China to be processed and then sending it back over here. Right, because they can do it cheaper. So the other thing with tilapia, I used to eat tilapia until I, wa I watched Dirty Jobs one day. My, oh my God. I saw Dirty Jobs and he was at a fish farm and the tilapia live in the bottom of the bass tank. So the bass get the good food when they sprinkle it on top, guess what the tilapia eat? The bass food. Yeah. Yeah, so I was like, nah, I don't think I'll eat that anymore. But, you know, sometimes if that's all there is in the restaurant, I, you know, I'll get it. You have to pick your battles, but I certainly wouldn't eat it every day. But, yeah, you're right. They're, they're shipping our stuff over to China for processing. Well, yeah. Yeah, so... No, they're not. Exactly. Exactly. So, yeah. Any other questions? Yes? With Elaine's question earlier, what makes people crave sweets at night? Because I know, like, everybody, a lot of people crave sweets at night before bed. Well, my first thought about craving sweets in general is that I would ask you to look at how many carbohydrates you've taken in during that day. Um, I would look there first and see if you have a lot of carbs in your diet because 
that's what typically drives a sweet craving. Like some people naturally have a sweet craving, but well, that depends. Well, um, if you are one, well, I, carbs are necessary. Some people accuse me of being a carbophobe. <laughs> I'm not a carbophobe because there's a necessary amount of carbohydrates that we need, but we don't need what the average American is eating, which is sometimes you know 200, 250 grams of carbs a day. So I shoot to keep my my carbs anywhere from like 75 to 100 grams. That might be lower than than some people are used to, but you know I can I can say that since I have been doing that. I don't crave sweet stuff. I really don't. Because I think you can break that cycle. The more sweets, the more carbs you eat, the more you're going to want because of how they affect you internally. So I would kind of look at that and maybe, you know, maybe just put your carbs with your dinner and that may be enough that you're not going to crave them um, later in the evening. And they're going to help you sleep better. If you eat them later in the day, you're going to get a, a better night's sleep with them. Mm -hmm. Could it be because maybe um, you're missing something in your diet? It could be, um, I guess. Certain nutrients maybe? It, it could be. There is some theory out there that, you know, if you're craving something and you don't take it in, that your body just keeps looking for it and that's why you keep eating all these different things. So, um, you know, there's something that might be, I would think. Yes? The opposite. The salty stuff. The crunchy stuff. I wonder with women if a lot of a lot of these cravings aren't hormonally driven, um, you know, and that's very common also. Um, you know, make sure that you're drinking enough water during the day, and you're not drinking, you're not drinking the water out on the market that's got all the flavorings and stuff in it. Just drink, you know, plain water. If you have to have flavor, you can use a little fresh lemon juice. Squeeze that in there. Limes are good in water. And isn't it true that uh, when we eat the fat is sweet that we put in our drinks and what have you? Yes. And it triggers a cycle yes. part of your brain that, that mm -hmm. continues to feed that right. for other Exactly. That's what artificial sweeteners do. And if you're using those in your diet, what there's a couple of things that they do. They trick your brain. Because you're, you know, it's sweet. Your brain is looking for the calories that come along with sweet food, and whenever it doesn't get those calories, it gets, it, it keeps looking for them. So it gives, you, it makes you keep wanting to look for that and eat more and more of that. The other thing that artificial sweeteners do, which, if you can ever get off of them, and then go back and taste something. Artificial sweeteners blunt our taste for sweetness. So you might start on an artificial sweetener and you keep using it, using it. You, you do, you're going to find you're using more and more and more of it because it blunts the sweetness. It's, not, it's almost like a drug in that effect. You want more of it. So if you can, and you can, eliminate artificial sweeteners, I would recommend it. They're known carcinogens. They're finding out more and more now that you know, they're linking Splenda now to leukemia. Um, sweet and low is linked to bladder cancer. So you really need to get artificial sweeteners out of your diet. And then you will, you will absolutely notice how sweet, yes, unless it's natural, you know, natural stevia that you grow yourself or what they've done to stevia, I had talked about this on Thrive TV, they, when stevia first came out, if you can remember, it did not taste very good. I remember when it came out, it left a really nasty aftertaste. It wasn't as sweet as what you were used to. So what they've done, because it wasn't selling, they've started to cut it with other things to make it taste better. So the stevia that you find out on the market, you pick up that box and look at it, it's going to have three or four additives in it. Now you can get natural stevia. You can grow a stevia plant and, and make your own and you know mush it up and all of that if you need that kind of stuff. But it's not going to be sweet. I can tell you, natural stevia is not not like like the stevia is out on the market. What's your take on like uh, real honey or agave or something like that? Agave, stay away from. Agave was preached to be the the new thing for diabetics. 
It's not going to drive your blood sugar up. I remember that because I had a coworker who was diabetic, and when that came out, I'm like, oh, Becky, oh my God, you can have this. This is supposed to be great for diabetics. And they are finding that it's just as bad as sugar is for a diabetic. So um, when it comes to natural sweeteners, honey, maple syrup, what's another one? There's three of them. I can't think of what the other one is. Yeah, so they still all break down in your body in the glucose, okay? Yes, there are some benefits to locally grown honey. You just can't, it's not, you just can't use it every day based on your goals. If you don't care and you're happy with your weight, and then you can have some honey in your coffee or you can put some honey in your tea. But if you're a person who's looking to reach a goal of weight loss, just remember, it's, it's still sugar, just a different form, okay? I know. <laughs> Believe. Wait, I'm, I'm totally off artificial sweetness. Well, congratulations, Elaine. That's awesome. It is hard, but you can get... Have you noticed? Have you noticed your taste changing, though? Oh, I can taste the sweetness in vegetables. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, it's amazing. I remember the first time I went back and I ate something that had sugar in it. I, f I literally felt like I could taste every grain of sugar. It was like, it was, I mean, I could feel it on my tongue. It was like, it was like crazy. Yeah, it was like crazy, so. Okay, Any, those are good questions, guys. Anything else? How'd you like the salad? You can be true. <laughs> was it good? All right, if you want the recipe, Jerry made copies. You can grab one. Okay. All right. Thank you, guys.